Welcome back to the first and last Exodus. As Jeremiah the prophet prophesied in the last days after Israel would be in exile for their disobedience, that the Almighty would reach out and gather Israel back into the land in the last days. We would no longer say, Yahuwah who lives, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, but Yahuwah who lives, who brought us out of the land of the north and all the nations where we have been scattered. He is going to do something so incredible that it will make the crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground, it will make it pale in comparison. But until that day, we have the crossing of the Red Sea, and it is not pale in comparison to anything else that has happened on the planet. Never before and never after in the history of the human race has the Almighty reached down from heaven and drawn a complete nation out from bondage from another nation, gathered them to a mountain, and shouted down his commandments, revealing himself. Every religion in the world has been basically founded by one guy going up on a mountain or into a swamp or something and coming out and saying, here's the new revelation. But for the Almighty to speak to an entire nation and for all of them to have experienced this, never before, never since, but yet in the last days, there's going to be something so monumental in the last exodus that it will make us even forget about the great glory of crossing the Red Sea. But this weekend is all about our first exodus. It is about that which has been challenged by professional theologians, by those who study the science of God and attempt to define him, by professional archaeologists, by professional historians who have rewritten history to make the Bible wrong and themselves right by their own lack of understanding of the historical evidence. But here in our studios, in the Aviv Moon Studios here in Charlotte, North Carolina, we have the filmmaker, Tim Mahoney, who has produced the Patterns of Evidence movie, The Exodus, and is soon to come out with the rest of the story as he takes us out of Egypt. Uh, with him is David Roll, the Egyptologist from Spain who has come in for the weekend and is basically working and rewriting with other scholars the new chronology to put all this together. Let all a man's ingeniousness fall by the wayside and let us hear how the whole thing fits together because the Almighty has left his patterns of evidence in the earth for his people for the last days. So I would like uh, our studio audience who's been gathered from around the world to give a warm welcome to all of our people all, all around the world to this weekend. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now it is my privilege to introduce to you again, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, our favorite filmmaker on the planet, Tim Mahoney. Thank you very Take much. Take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, audience, and thank you out there in cyberspace uh, around the world for tuning into this uh, time to talk about the Exodus. And you know, I was thinking about, you said, well, I'm gonna do a teaching. Well, a lot of things that I've decided was, uh, was just to do a sharing, just to basically share how I got to this point and give context. And I think that David uh, Roll earlier today has helped uh, to, sh to sh explain context uh, with some of the stuff that he's taught us already. And uh, one of the things that I, I became aware of uh, through this, I want to give you a little bit of background that I started to understand when we talked about this this testimony. In fact, you're, you've got a you've got this Bible here, and it, it's called it's divided into two books, right? The Old Testament and New Testament. And this word testament, what does that word mean? We shared just a little bit. Of, it's a testimony, and uh, I think that you know if we look at the the books, the Book of Revelation, it's a testimony. Uh, all these different books are, are testimonies of what happened, the Gospels. They're testimonies. And, and so I'm going to share with you a little bit of my testimony in the sense that what happened to me, you know, how, how this, I'm going to give you a little bit. People have asked me sometimes, and I haven't shared much publicly, well, how in the world did you get involved with all this? This seems like such a big, you know, undertaking and going off. And, and I'm going to give you, I'll tell you just a few stories about how it happened and how you know we moved forward and like I said in the very beginning I was just on a bit of an adventure I think that guys want to go on adventures I mean have you ever looked how many guys actually look at maps 
And when you look at a map, especially when I look at an ancient map, I go, I wonder what that that river is like. I wonder what that mountain would be like. And you just, I just love maps because when you're a kid, it's like buried treasure, all sorts of stuff that's out there like that. And and as I started to to uh, meet with people uh, and talk about these things, and they talked about going to Egypt and going into tombs or temples. I mean, that's all Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of fun, right? I mean, it just seems like a really cool adventure to go on. And that's what drew me in the beginning to want to go and look for this material. The other, the other, the other thing that happened was that, was that I started to look at the Bible. I mean, I would read these passages, and I was trying to put pieces together. And what I'd like to share with the audience is that, you know, I didn't feel, I'll have to be honest with you, when I was growing up, because I was in this this uh, uh, broken home, I would just call it what it was. And I, you know, when you're a kid, you're so embarrassed about the fact that I didn't have a dad around, and that my we were actually on welfare, and it was difficult. And my mom would go to the grocery store, and I was a carryout at the grocery store, and we got food stamps, and you know it was hard. And I remember saying, you know, my mom would be like, she'd try not to buy food when I was there. You know, it was a difficult time. And you're, you're thinking about about that about that uh, dependency that we had upon, you know, God and, and sort of helping us through these difficult times. And I was thinking about, uh, you know, my background and, and what drew me into searching for this story. Because once again, my mother, I know your mother's right over here, Michael, you know, our, our parents have a legacy that they give to us. And my mother had this legacy of faith that she, she gave to me and gave to, to our family. And uh, so uh, this idea of going on an adventure and searching for the legacy of the Bible was really, I thought, uh, it, it, met, it met my manly guy thing, and it met my, uh, my historical, my family legacy thing. And so when I went on that adventure, you know, that, that's really what it was, was an adventure. And it was right after 9-11, as we talked about, that, that I went to Egypt the first time. And I went with Dr. Moeller, and we went to the Sinai, and we went to all, the, all these different crossing locations as we were looking for this. We went to uh, Nuiba, and uh, there were people diving there. So I didn't know anything about anything. I mean, honestly, I, 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 I just knew the basics of the story. And then over time, what ended up happening was I started reading more and more, and I started looking. I mean, this just sounds crazy, but... I didn't know that the book of Deuteronomy was connected to the book of Exodus. I mean, I was just thinking Exodus was the main thing. Oh, I know David is just going like, Tim, how could you not know that? But I'm confessing it publicly here. I mean, I, I, I'll just tell you that I think a lot of us, and you know what's very funny in a sad way, is that when I started filming scholars and even people that were uh, ministers or different people who, who were at colleges or whatever, I. I would have to correct them on the story because they didn't know the details of the story. And you started to realize that, wait a minute, I'd have to, excuse me for a second here. I mean, I would, it even happened a few times with rabbis. I said, no, that's not exactly what it says. And they go, oh, really? Let me just show you over here. <laughs> you know, oh, okay. Because they, you see, they just sort of knew the overview of the story. But what we started to realize in making the film was that the, that the details were what was very important. The detail, what was what what we started to look at. And then I started to go back, if you go back to the very beginning of this testimony that there, that there is of the story of, of, of the Bible, what happens in the Garden of Eden is that there is this, this narrative that Adam and Eve are there and there's this tree, they're not supposed to eat of it, right? And this is the beginning of what they call the fall. And this serpent comes along. And what does the serpent say in the very beginning? Did God really say, did God really say you're not supposed to eat of this fruit? So what I saw that the very first part of this whole narrative starts out with questioning the truth of God's word. I go, wow, that is very interesting from a many from many ways to look at it. So we know that from the very beginning, the very introduction of this story. Is, is that. And I think that in the book of Revelation, it says don't add anything. In the book of Revelation, I think John writes, don't add anything to this. If you do, you're in trouble. So from the beginning, it's about the word. And then at the end, it's about don't add anything to it. 
Now, another interesting thing I noticed was that when Jesus uh, is, um, is present, Yeshua, as you would say, uh, the first time uh, Satan meets him, what does he do? He questions, he challenges the meaning of God's word. Mm-hmm. And I go, well, there it is again, <laughs> you know, this challenging of this word. And then I, I notice that there is a verse that says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And that's in John, I believe. And so I started to see there's a connection here, that there's this constant conflict between, well, what does it say and what does it mean? And, and uh, did it really happen? And is it a myth? And we're asking, you know, uh, uh, David's book is Exodus, myth or history? Myth or history? And what we're seeing is, remember that verse I shared with you early on? It says, uh, it said, um, don't forget. Don't forget that I did this with this mighty hand. I took you out. Never has it happened mm-hmm. before that I'm going to take a nation out of another nation. And uh, I didn't share this with, uh, with too many people, but we think, well, this happened a long, long, long time ago. And you think, well, if a generation is 30 years, and I don't have any graphics for this, but it's about 3,500 years ago that this happened. And I'm going to round it up to 3,600 just for math purposes. But if, how many times does 30, 30 years, and I have a son, and my son is 30. I have one son who's 30, and one's a little bit older, and he just had a son. And that's a generation, and, and my father, and my grandfather, and, and so there's generations about every 30 years. I'm just going to say an average of. Do you know that it's only 120 generations back to the Exodus? If you flew here on a plane, uh, the plane can hold more than people than that, probably up to 240, you know, depending on how big the plane is. So, so half the plane would be filled, and you'd get you'd all the way back in time to the Exodus. It's not really that long ago when you think about it. And so I was looking at that and realizing that what I was involved with, so as a filmmaker, you're saying, well, how am I going to make this film? How do I tell this story? And for me, that was one of the most difficult challenges because I remember people saying, uh, well, he said a lot of things, but I was kind of like the loser guy, you know, because I couldn't finish this film. I didn't even know how to get it going. All I knew, I was filming and filming and filming. And in the very beginning, when we went in 2002, we went to Egypt, I filmed lots of material, but I didn't exactly know what, how we were going to use it. But I just kept filming. And, and then we had a sense that we should go and investigate more, and we went into other parts of the Middle East. And then later on, we went to Israel, because I realized that this was a story about the nation of Israel. And some people, if you see in the film, I have one of the you know, interviews with Benjamin Netanyahu, and people say, well, how in the world did you get that interview? And uh, that's a good question. And I, uh, as, we, as we went, we, we had this very strong impression that we, we couldn't finish the film that we had and that, that we needed to go to Israel. And so we contacted a woman in Israel who is an Israeli producer. And she says, I don't know what this is about, but I think it's really important for Israel. And she got behind it, and her family was well known. Uh, her father was a, an Air Force commander, and so she had a connection with the, the government. And she just said, uh, well, there's a very important film that's going to be made, and lots of people are going to see it, and she, that's what she sold. And she went to, I said, I want to see Benjamin Netanyahu and Shimon Perez, and I want to see ambassadors. I just, I just said, I want to see everybody. <laughs> and... Uh, and you know what? I got to see uh, everybody. I, I mean, I was a remarkable, but I was there for three weeks, and I managed to get appointments with all the key people. Uh, and, and I wasn't alone when I went to those. I mean, I, I, mean, I felt that there was a presence uh, that, that when I went to do those interviews that, that helped me. And I decided uh, very early on, I, I realized that if I don't, if I have a bunch of notes, and if I am staring down, I'm not really having an interview, <laughs> you see. So I had to rehearse and understand and understand the material. And when I went to the Knesset to interview Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, because he's such a world prominent figure right now, especially with the conflicts that are going on, um, you know, you had to go, this was, this was between the one prime minister t- term, and, and he was not a prime minister at the time, but he had j- then, right after I filmed them, he became a prime minister again. And so I was kind of in that window of opportunity. 
and and so I remember going down the plaza to the Knesset, you know, and then with our, you know, dragging the equipment along and then going through this uh, intensive security search. You know, you don't want to sneeze or do anything uh, uh, too fast when you're in those uh, situations. You kind of got the security, the secret service of the Israelis there. Is it the Mossad or whatever? Whoever it was that was protecting him. And um, um, so, I remembered waiting for him. I got into his office, man, when you've got like just 10 minutes to set up all the lights and get everything going, and my heart's starting to beat a little bit. You know, I'm getting excited. And uh, I remember all of a sudden, you hear the scurry, he's coming. And he enters the room, and he has his deep voice. I can't do his, you could probably do his voice, but I can do it. But he basically says, uh, what's this all about? And I said, I'm making, a, I'm making a film about the exodus, and I believe a lot of people are going to see it. He goes, okay, let's do it. You know, and so he sits down, and, mm -hmm. and I sit down, and, and uh, I, got, uh, I said, tell me the first time you heard the stories of the Bible. And he says, well, when, I was nurse, when my mother was nursing me. I, you know, <laughs> I didn't expect that, by the way. You know, every, every Jewish child hears the stories of the Bible. And I said, tell me about Joseph. And he said, Joseph, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And as you listen to him speak, and you listen to, because his father was a scholar and, um, uh, and taught at the university, and you start to realize there's a, there's a presence and an aura about certain people. And I felt that with Benjamin Netanyahu and, and also with Shimon Perez. These men were leaders. You could tell there was something about them that made them great. And then I remember what ended up happening. I was only supposed to talk with him for 10 minutes. And um, what ended up happening was that someone, uh, I, had, I had spent uh, several days reading his biography. And he had talked about his grandfather, Nathan. And I believe they lived in Poland. Uh, and uh, his grandfather was a young yeshiva, uh, was at a yeshiva? Yeshiva student. Yeah, yeshiva student. And, and um, actually more like probably a teenager and his little brother, and they were coming, they were near a railroad station, and a bunch of toughs, tough, uh, you know, I don't know, a gang of, of other boys saw them, and they knew that they were going to beat him up and really hurt him. And he told his younger brother to run, and he would stay there and fight them, or, or, or at least be the bait while the younger brother got away. And as they, as they knocked him into unconsciousness and kicked him, uh, he swore uh, that he would, if he lived through this, that he would find a way to go to, to Israel. And, um, and so when he's talked about his, his when, he, when, he, when he mentioned my grandfather, he's telling about his grandfather teaching him the stories of the Bible, I said, Nathan? And that was his grandfather's name. And he said, yes. And once I said Nathan, Benjamin Netanyahu and I were on another level. And uh, my 10 minute interview went to 50 minutes. And what ended up happening was, was that we talked and I asked him questions. I asked him questions about um, you know, Moses and the Exodus. And I asked him about, uh, uh, about the covenant that God had made with the Jewish people. And I asked him about the, the diaspora and about the return. And I asked him a variety of different things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's wine in the cellar right now. Uh, it's an amazing interview that we have that, that we're waiting for the next films to come out. But I, uh, and the same thing with Shimon Perez. When I went into his office and was able to meet with him and talk with him, there was, uh, the, the interviews were amazing. Uh, and what he said and what he shared and we were at a whole other level, and that was about a 50-minute interview. And I realized that I had been given a privilege that many people don't have. I mean, here I am. I'm really just a nobody guy. You know, I was talking to you about, you know, being raised in this single-parent home, and I didn't care about school when I was growing up because, you know, the fact that my family was torn apart and I was just, you know, without a dad. I mean, when I got, when, at the end of school, I used to take my books and throw it in the locker, and I didn't feel like too, much, too smart of a guy because I didn't care. It wasn't until 11th grade when a teacher said to me, Mr. Mahoney, that was a very good answer. And I thought, you know, maybe I could understand this. It was in a history class, and maybe I could understand this. I started under reading history and learning more about it. 
And here I am sitting with the Prime Minister of Israel and the President of Israel on this film. And I think that there's a lot of us like me that kind of feel like, you know, you don't get it or you don't fit in or whatever. And I think the thing that I would like to say is that if we go back to that verse that my wife told me about, Ephesians 2.10, that from the beginning of time, there are things that we're called to do, that even though I had a rough start, every, lots of people have rough starts in their life, and, and you just have to move past it. And I started to realize that I c was a thinker, and I did have ideas, and I did have questions, and I was able to construct things. And, and, and I took that journey of my life, and that led me and helped me to get to the point where there I was in Israel talking to the prime minister of that nation, one of the key people uh, that's in the world of politics today, and asking questions about the Bible and the historical credibility of the Bible. Because we know that there's so many people in, that have paid a price, right? They have paid dearly if these stories. And so the question is, is why would you die for a fairy tale? And why would people kill you for a fairy tale? And, and uh, so the question about are these stories true or not is a very important question because it impacts everything. If, this, if these events didn't happen, then we might as well just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, right? I mean, that's kind of the, yeah. the idea behind it. And that's kind of what the rest of the world thinks. And that's the, that's the course that they're on. And so I thought that there has to be more to this. There's something that's going on here, and I wanted to find out about it. And so in a way, as a filmmaker, I also knew that when I would go there, I wanted to hear why you don't believe. Because I think it's very important for me to understand. If you don't understand or you don't think there's any evidence for this, I want to know. Tell me what your reasons are. Tell me what your reasons are that you believe in this area and this area. And I think that what I started to see in this Bible was that it was good for you to, to, to look and question what people were saying. Because if you don't understand or the original, you won't understand counterfeit, right? And so I had to basically start to say that, because I think there's a sense of it in culture today is that, oh, I don't know anything about that. I just do whatever they tell me, you know? And that's dangerous because there's a lot of times people tell you stuff that's just, and, and you're, you're, you're basically saying to yourself, I'm not smart enough to understand this, and so somebody else who's smarter should just figure it out. And I think that I, what I would say to the audience and to you is that I don't think that's the right idea. I think that we've got to be thinking people, uh, thinking men and thinking women, to basically look at these ideas, and just as we've talked about before, you know, with your pharmaceutical questions that are, that are, that are out there. You know, just because you think someone's smarter than you, their feed, if, uh, if what they're giving you is not healthy, then you better pay attention and take responsibility for what, what's going, what you're ingesting. Whether you're ingesting things into your body or into your mind, so I think that's the common thread here, is that you know, you've got, to, you've got to be careful what you put in your mind, and you can be a good at, at trying to make those critical decisions. And that, as a filmmaker, then, was what I started to realize. Because I started to then film <coughs> viewpoints without f having to worry too much about being threatened by them. Because the standard I was looking at was the Bible. So what does the Bible say, and how does that match up with what we're seeing here? And I had to have a certain level of faith that in time I would be able to sort it out. That was sort of the, the, the question. And the challenge that I had was, would I offend people? You know, I'm from Minnesota. Have you ever heard of Minnesota nice? You know, you don't, you know, the Scandinavians up there, well, I'm an Irish Scandinavian. So I've got a little bit of the fight in me and a little bit of the sweetness in me. But um, uh, the, uh, well, you've been to Minnesota. You understand that. But... Um, so anyway, so that's part of, part of what was going on in my life as a filmmaker. I was trying to understand how do I make a film that's this complex? And part of it had to do with my own personal journey. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to take the audience on my own journey. That's what I need to do. And I need to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. I'm a guy. I'm a guy who, uh, who has questions. And I'm going to take other people along with me and I'm going to ask those questions, and I'm going to make if you I'm going to make it so that you understand every word, you understand the word, and you understand where things are going to be. That's why we made the film very visual with the wall of time, 
and we're, and we're going to go talk to people because this audience isn't just for believers. This is for people who don't believe or people that are on the outside. I'm going to try to say, okay, everybody, let's come along and ask this question and, ask, and understand these questions. And so that was the approach then. That's the reason why I had to allow more people into this film and onto this journey. And so I think that gives you a little bit of context, and it was challenging. I mean, I have to tell you something. There's, in the middle of this, I thought, I'm going bankrupt. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to ever get this thing finished. And I was, it was tragic. And I got depressed. I bought a camping trailer and uh, was so depressed. I, I, went, not that, uh, I went camping. One year, I camped for 90 days. Uh, yeah, and just watched, you know, campfires. I didn't do it all in a row, by the way. I was just, you know, weekends whenever I could to try to just emotionally recover from the challenge of all the trips, multiple trips to Europe and to uh, funding all this and trying to get by, making commercials and then trying to go film and edit. And it seemed like we were getting nowhere. But I knew that I couldn't quit. I had to keep trying to understand what this was. I kept saying, what in the world is this about? And I had a sense that this was about a theme. And the theme was remembrance and forewarning. Now, what that means, I'm still trying to understand it, but I think I get the remembrance. It goes back to don't forget what God did by bringing these people out of Egypt. And when I go to New York or I go to other places and show this film, People are impacted in a great way because I think they have not believed it, even though they think it's all right, that they've just never felt like they've been connected to it. So for whatever reason, for whatever time in history this is, this information is important. And, f and I, all I can say to you is that I'm going to continue to try to unfold it and take you on this journey as I meet more and more people and I ask the questions, what does the Bible say about this? And then I'm going to go, we're going to go look for that. What does the Bible say about this and about that? And we're going to continue to unfold it. So that's the, that's the vision of what this is all about. And with that, I think it's time to bring David up, and he can expand a much deeper level. So. Intellectual indigestion from this morning. Have you got that? I did pretty good at 30 minutes exactly. You, are, you got an awful lot of things to think about from this morning's talk. <coughs> and we're ready for round two now. Um, you'll be pleased to know round two is a lot easier to take on board. And it's very rewarding because now we're in the payoff. We are now going to deliver the payoff <coughs> of the chronology of the reworking of the biblical timeline in relationship to Egypt. So I'm going to go straight on to the visuals. We've got quite a bit to get through, and the idea is we're going to present different sections, stop for a little while, have a chat about it, then go back to the next section and work our way through so that we get questions and discussions in while we still can remember <coughs> the subject material, okay? And then, of course, you're going to have a chance later on to have some Q&A. So if we can start off with the visuals. As you can see, the, the important thing on this screen is the question mark down there. It's not a statement, it's a question. Whether or not this exodus is mythological, is it Harry Potter, or is it something more than Harry Potter? Do you, uh, the basis of your faith and religion, is it a fairy tale, or is it something very real, very historical? Now, as an archeologist and a historian, I can't deal with miracles. I can only give you the historical elements of the story. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's the framework upon which and the foundation upon which you base your faith. And as Tim said, it's all about reason. You cannot have a book that is the basis of everything you believe if you think that is not true, if that's a fairy story. That foundation there is everything. So as a, an agnostic, as a historian, I look at this as a historical text. I do not dismiss it as a fairy story, just because it's called the Bible. I treat it like any other ancient text, whether it be Herodotus, whether it be a text of Ramesses II talking about the Battle of Kadesh. It's a history book. Primarily, it's a history book upon which the faith is based. And that's the way I approach it. So, we've got a question mark down there, and I'm going to be able to take that question mark off 
and dismiss the myth and leave us with history. And we'll do that now with this new chronology that we've devised, so we have a completely new canvas to work with. We can now construct the story of the Bible in relationship to Egypt, in relationship to the archaeology, because we haven't got that terrible Shishak blunder anymore. Okay? So let's go. First of all, we're going to deal with the academic approach to this from the last 35 years or so, what we call the myth. This myth has evolved from scholarship, people looking at the material from an archaeological perspective, also from a theological perspective and a historical sp perspective. And the conclusion that most of these academics have come to is it's a history that never happened. It's an invention of the priests of later times, creating this pious myth in order to give somebody a foundation for their nation and their belief systems. Okay? But we're going to show that wrong. So you're going to get a few negatives here, and then we'll move on to the really positive stuff. Okay? So the basis upon the whole thing is, of course, this gentleman here. We all know him, Yul Brynner as Ramesses II, and his buddy, his best mate, Charlton Heston. <laughs> this is what we grow up with. We've grown up with it for the last century, virtually, since the cinema world began with the first black and white version of Cecil B. DeMille's film. But of course, he based the whole thing on what he was told by scholarship, which was that Ramesses II was the pharaoh of the Exodus and the oppression, and that Moses lived in the time of the 19th dynasty, which is when Ramesses was obviously reigning. And that was what we call the Ramesses Exodus theory. Now, um, a lot of conservative evangelical scholars would say, well, that can't be right, because if we look at the date, Ramesses II and Moses, in this model, places the Exodus around 1250 BC. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible has a different date, roughly 200 years earlier. And yet scholars have gone for this date simply because of the connection, the city of Ramses, which the Israelites built, that you find in the first few lines of the book of Exodus. And on that basis alone, and nothing else, we have a 1250 BC date for the Exodus in scholarship. As I say, some scholars go for 1450 BC, which places the same event in the 18th dynasty, in the middle of the 18th dynasty, okay? So the question is, was this really when it happened? I would say no. And most of the scholars you're going to see here also say no, not because they want to prefer the 18th dynasty date, because they didn't think it happened at all certainly not in the time of Ramesses. Now, the basis for this argument, this negative argument, is this place, Jericho. Joshua then destroyed Jericho around 1210 BC, which is 40 years after 1250 and the Exodus. That's the rough date, approximate date, that people place the destruction of Jericho. Now, I'm going to start giving you a few quotes now. Somebody you've probably never heard of called John McCarthy. He was one of the Beirut hostages, a British uh, newspaper man who went to Beirut and was captured by Hezbollah and imprisoned along with American hostages and Terry Waite. And while he was in his dungeon for many years, the only book he had to read was the Bible. And he sat there in the dark trying to read this book over and over again. And he wasn't a religious man, but it's the only book he had to read. And he got deeply involved in the story. And when he eventually he was released, he decided what he was going to do is find a historian, John Sturgis, and he's going to write a book about his thoughts about the biblical story. And because he was a newspaper man, he went off and interviewed lots of scholars and archaeologists working in Israel and other parts of Egypt, trying to get an idea from them what they thought happened in the Bible stories. And he made a documentary series called It Ain't Necessarily So. You know, know the Porgy and Bess folk opera, where you get, um, I think its name was Sporting Life, played by Sammy Davis Jr. And he did this song called It Ain't Necessarily So, the things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. And he took that title for a good reason, because every single scholar he went to, every single archaeologist said, the Bible isn't true. It ain't necessarily so. So here's a quote from John McCarthy. When the site at Jericho was reworked in the 1950s by Kathleen Kenyon, it was discovered that the walls had fallen down long before Joshua and his people were supposed to have arrived. 
and that at that time, Jericho was almost certainly unoccupied. The conquest of the promised land by the children of Israel began to evaporate into thin, hazy air. He just, every single person he talked to said, there was no Jericho at the time of Ramesses II. And that is true. That is absolutely true. So, let's move on. If we now see where the, the problem lies, I'm going to use this graphic to do that. Now, it looks fairly simple at the moment, but it's going to get quite complicated in a second. So we're going to have some archaeology here. These phases that you see here are archaeological phases. LB is late bronze or late bronze age, and then iron age, iron age. So you have the late bronze 2A, followed by the late bronze 2B, and then the iron age begins working towards the present. And here are your conventional datings for these eras. So for instance, the end of the late bronze age comes in about 1250, between 1250 and 1200, okay? Already you should be thinking this is the time of the Exodus, according to the conventional scheme. Let's now put in the biblical events. So in the late bronze 2A, we have part of the Sojin, which is also earlier. Then in the late bronze 2B, this is where we place Moses and the Exodus. And then we have the Judges period in two phases, going through towards the united monarchy of Saul, David, and Solomon. Now, if I put in the Egyptian data to match that, we end up with Akhenaten and Tutankhamun down here, then the famous Ramesses II of the 19th dynasty as a contemporary of Moses in the late Bronze Age, and then Ramesses III in the 20th dynasty and on back into the third intermediate period. This is the period that I've been specializing in. So you begin to see the relationships between the biblical story, the archaeology, and the Egyptian history. This is the conventional scheme. This is not the new scheme that we've been developing. This is the way that scholars see it conventionally. So now you can see there's one column I haven't filled in yet, and that is Jericho. Now see what happens to Jericho. Well, first of all, we find a large farm or house in the late Bronze 2A that was excavated. It's called the middle building by archaeologists because it falls in the middle of a gap. It's probably was occupied for about 20 years maximum by I mean, no more than a dozen people. But the rest of the site basically was completely unwalled and uh, an abandoned ruin. And then in the Iron Age 1B, a new town is founded. This town thrives and continues on afterwards. And I'll explain a little bit about what that town is later. But then, just at the time when we have Moses and the Exodus, and therefore Joshua and the conquest, we have a huge black hole. There is nothing at Jericho between this house and that town. And that's where the conquest is placed. Now do you see why scholars and archaeologists say that it's impossible for the Bible to be true? Because Joshua there and Jericho just do not match. So Bill Deaver, who's a biblical archaeologist from the USA, he said this about Jericho. Jer Joshua destroyed a city that wasn't even there. And this is the mantra that we have now. And it's the starting point for this whole negativity that we see from scholarship. Zeev Herzog, who's a professor of history and archaeology in Israel, a famous one, he created a forum a Ferrari, rather, of um, debate and argument in, amongst the press in Israel when he announced that the Exodus is a history that never happened. So you have Israeli archaeologists and historians, you have American archaeologists, you have British archaeologists, all saying the same thing. The Bible is a fiction because Jericho didn't exist at the time when Joshua was supposed to have been there. So, an Exodus in the 19th dynasty... That is looking extremely <coughs> unlikely. There was no exodus at the time of Ramesses II. Now, that is a truth. That is a fact. I'm not disputing that. Nobody's disputing that. That's what archaeology tells us happened. Okay? So, we have to explain it. We can either say the Bible is a fairy story, or we have to be sensible about this and look for an alternative reasoning. And that's what I did. 
Let's look at what Finkelstein, who is the doyen of Israeli archaeology, has to say about early Israel. That's the, the formation of the state after the so-called conquest, which he doesn't believe in. There was no mass exodus from Egypt. There was no violent conquest of Canaan. Something clearly doesn't add up when the biblical account, the archaeological evidence, and the Egyptian records are placed side by side. Again, this is absolutely true. But what they do is, they simply reject the Bible and take everything on board as being factual. They take the Egyptian records to be true, they take the archaeological evidence to be true, and their interpretation of it, so the thing that gets put in the dustbin is that book. And when we see, and this is in the film, you'll see this later on, this remarkable interview between David Wolpe and Michael Medved, this is David Wolpe on this side, your number one rabbi in the United States. This is what he had to say in the interview, and I find this quite extraordinary. Medved asked him, in 2001, Rabbi Wolpe, he created a national furor when his Passover sermon challenged the historical reality of the Exodus. Rabbi Wolpe, what did you say? And this is his response. The Exodus certainly didn't happen the way that Bible depicted it, assuming that it was a historical event of any description. I think that if you look at the, it scientifically, it's virtually indefensible to make the Bible's case. Remember, this is a rabbi speaking. What part of the Torah would you grant to be based upon historical reality? The reply, I can't tell you. I don't know. I don't know, and although it might irk people, I don't care. So there's a rabbi telling his congregation that it doesn't matter if the Bible isn't true. Just accept the moral teachings without the history. You don't need the foundation. The foundation is not important. So, the academic conclusion to all this, and I've only given you a small set of highlights because there are a lot more quotes that I could have put in there. As there is no archaeological evidence to confirm or even support the stories of the Old Testament, it's logical to conclude that the Bible is a work of fiction. That is the academic position that we're in at the moment. And now we try to explain that visually with Tim's wonderful wall of time from the movie, which you'll see later. He has the animated. I can't animate it here. But we have... According to Tim, he's divided up this whole era from the beginning of the sojourn with the arrival, the multiplication, the slavery, the judgment, the exodus and the conquest. Those are the, that's the pattern that we're looking at. And we have to try and find out where that pattern really works, those six steps. And if you look at it in the 19th dynasty we've been talking about, here's your pattern here. But in this period, as we've seen from the archaeologist's point of view, there is no match, there is no correspondence in that period. Or you may notice, back here, there does seem to be something going on, which we're going to get to later. And then those scholars who want to have the 1450 BC date, the, ba the date that's actually in the Bible, uh, the date from the time of the construction of the temple, back 480 years, you get to this, this period of around 1450 BC, and we find ourselves now in the 18th dynasty of the New Kingdom, and again we have an exodus with nothing corresponding in the archaeological record in Egypt. And ironically, these two pharaohs are now, in those two models, the pharaohs of the exodus. Ramesses II in 1250, and the pharaoh Thutmose III in 1450 BC. They happen to be the two most powerful, influential, and richest pharaohs in the entire New Kingdom history of Egypt. How likely is it, therefore, that in the most stable periods of Egyptian history, the Israelites destroyed the country, left it in complete destruction and abandonment, went off to conquer the Promised Land without the Egyptians making any effort to stop them? There is no sign at all in those two reigns of a crumbling of the Egyptian state. There is absolutely no sign in these two reigns of any sort of loss of control in Palestine, in Syria, in Canaan, for the uh, window of opportunity for the Israelites to come in under Joshua and actually conquer the place. It just doesn't work. Neither case works. 
So here we come with the what if. My question was then, very simple. What if scholars have been looking in the right places for the Bible stories, but in entirely the wrong time? That was the simple and obvious question to be asked, which nobody had actually asked. Nobody had bothered to ask that question. So if we now look at Jericho, and we look at it in this light, what if we find the Jericho that was destroyed and work from there? If the Bible tells us Joshua destroyed Jericho and it's abandoned for centuries, why don't we look for that Jericho? Instead of saying, oh, well, it's not possible Jericho wasn't there, let's find the city of Jericho that was destroyed. Now, we know where Jericho is, Tel Es Sultan. We always know where the location is. There's no question about the identity of the place. So here we are looking at the Iron Age town that we saw earlier on, the Dark Age, and down here we have the Middle Bronze Age city, a flourishing, powerful city with high walls. So what we're going to do is we're going to start to investigate this city because this city's walls collapsed. It was heavily burnt and abandoned for centuries, exactly like the Joshua story. And then we have this 600-year gap until the refounding of the city in the time of Ahab and Omri. If you remember the story of Hiel, who comes and founds the rebuilt city of Jericho on the, be the bodies of his two sons, one under the gates and the other under the foundations. So the question is, <coughs> was this city the one that Joshua destroyed? The Middle Bronze 2B city. And if the, that's the case, then we have to put the conquest right at the point where the city is destroyed and therefore the exodus 40 years earlier in this Middle Bronze Age period. So we've moved ourselves from the Late Bronze Age where the conventional dating is and we've moved the whole story into the Middle Bronze Age, a whole era earlier. And that's where we're going to concentrate later on today on the conquest and before that the exodus and before that the sojourn. So that's the point where we're going to have a li little chat about it and I'll come on then and I'll start working through the history line from Joseph onwards. Well, so while I have a slurp, one of you come up with a brilliant question to ask me. We're stunned. Yeah, You're stunned? <laughs> well, I think that uh, a lot of people might not be aware of what happened with the, uh, the digs that were done at Jericho. And what, why Jericho was the, and I didn't know at the time, but there, were, there was a German uh, before, I think it was World War I. Ernst Selin. Uh, Selin. Mm -hmm. Zellin. Uh, and he actually <coughs> went to that location uh, and uh, uncovered quite a bit. He and, did. He and did. he, and tell us what happened with this. <coughs> well, the, the, the time that Selin was working there, we hadn't got a proper, what we call, pottery chronology. Mm -hmm. So it, it was very difficult for us to, nobody had actually worked out what type of pot was from a particular period. So for instance, if I find one of these pots here, if you find a, a fragment like that, we call a sherd in the ground, this is actually from the Iron Age. But you can tell by the, the fabric and the coating of the paintwork. And if you have a lip like this one here, then you can start to know what the shape of the pot is. So that's a rim from the top. And sometimes you can pick up whole pots. And it's these things that enable us to date them in a sequence because they develop and evolve just like our pottery does today. So what you're saying is that, is that they started to realize that they were, even they were calling it bronze and uh, yeah. they weren't it, actually working with bronze, they were absolutely. working with pottery. It's nothing to do with metals. Right. It somehow got that name and, and so the type of pottery that was created, they started to figure out when that type of pottery and designs were made mm -hmm. and they broke off and then they just disposed of them in the local little pottery dump. Well, the fantastic thing about pottery and the reason why we have some on this desk here is because it doesn't disappear. It breaks up into small pieces, but you can't destroy it. It's like plastic. And so you can find this in the ground, and if you can get enough pieces together to assemble a pot, you can tell from which period that pot was made. And then you can date that stratum, that layer of the site, to that particular archaeological phase. Mm -hmm. and, so that's and that's how they date so the system. It's going to be another 60 years before Kathleen Canyon comes along then. Exactly. She and comes along, the and now we have the pottery sequence worked out. Ah. Now we're in business. And she can revise what Selin and Garstang did with their original findings. And she disappoints the biblical world mm -hmm. because she turns around and says, 
Well, I'm afraid Jericho was destroyed hundreds of years before Ramesses II. And that's the end of it. That's the start of the negativity with that one discovery. And ironically, that is the very moment that Cecil B. DeMille was making his movie. So you see the issues here. If you understand the chronology and the archaeology and the historical interpretation, it's quite obvious that these scholars are not wrong in the way they dismiss the biblical story in the time of Ramesses. They're dead right. That is exactly true. There was no conquest of the Promised Land. There was no uh, departure of Israelites from Egypt. There was no large population of Semites living in Egypt in the Eastern Delta at the time of Ramesses. And so their answer is not to look elsewhere, simply to say, the Bible, we have to dismiss it. And I would say that a lot of these scholars, it's not as if they're uh, trying to be uh, anti-Bible in the sense that they I think that that has started to grow because there, it's almost become, don't go there, now you're being religious. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's almost to the, the <coughs> pendulum swung over so far that they're no longer willing to even talk about it. And that's what I started to realize was that the interviews got shorter uh, when I was trying to ask questions about it because it's like we're past that phase. That was a phase uh, that people went through, but now we have so much more information that we're past that phase. But what I then came to understand was that, was that they all got their phasing, uh, uh, trying to tie the word together, with their, with their chronology from Egypt. And, and most of the people I talked with weren't chronologists. No. They were not chronologists. They were just given a measuring, they were <coughs> giving a, a yardstick mm -hmm. uh, from Egypt. And then I found out that that yardstick was created several hundred years earlier uh, parts of it before they really knew what they're talking about. Right. Precisely right. I mean, you take the front of this desk here. An art historian can immediately tell you that this inscription along the top here is from the New Kingdom, from the Ramesside period. But the one underneath, this is Greco Roman era, this is Ptolemaic. And you've got the name Ptolemy written here in a cartouche. You can see immediately the difference in the styles. So experts can tell a pot from a particular period. You can easily identify a Middle Bronze Age pot compared to a Late Bronze Age pot and an Iron Age pot. No difficulty in doing that. So when, you, when Kenyon goes and looks at Jericho, she finds no late Bronze Age pottery at all. And then they only start with pottery from the Iron Age 1B. And she has to say there's no occupation there because we don't have the tools of living. Mm -hmm. This is the proof of life. OK, if you don't have that in a, in a site, then the site is not occupied. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is the, this is the conundrum we have, we're faced with. So now. With this new idea of working with the Jericho that was destroyed, the one that we know was destroyed towards the end of the Middle Bronze Age, now if we project back into Egyptian history, we see a wholly different picture of the Israelites in Egypt, and which is what I'm going to go on to now, if you okay. don't mind. So let's start with the sojourn. We're going to work forward in time now, from the arrival of the Israelites in Egypt through to the Exodus and beyond. And it starts with prosperity followed by slavery. You know the story. Joseph comes into Egypt as a slave. He rises to the ranks. He helps to uh, explain Pharaoh's dreams for him. He becomes the highest official in the land. His family are brought in from Canaan during the famine period, and they are given the best part of Egypt to live in. They prosper and multiply, and then they're suddenly plunged into slavery. And then on comes Moses and the Exodus after that. But let's first of all look at the beginnings of all this. Just to recap where we are then, here is our, we're in now the Middle Bronze Age. Middle Bronze 1, Middle Bronze 2A, Middle Bronze 2B, that's the archaeology. In Egypt, this is the 12th dynasty, the 13th dynasty, and something called the Hyksos period, which I'll deal with in a moment. So in this new timeline, Jericho was destroyed during the Middle Bronze 2B. We're not quite sure where in this phase, but it's somewhere in this period here. And then in the 12th dynasty here, we have the arrival of the Israelites. This is how it works with the biblical chronology in relationship to archaeology. And you'll notice something very interesting. We have one phase called Middle Bronze 2A, which is actually matching exactly with the Israelite sojourn in Egypt. And then we have the conquest 40 years later. So the Exodus takes place in the transition between Middle Bronze 2A and Middle Bronze 2B. And over here, at the end of the 13th dynasty, followed by the Hyksos period. 
Now, the Hyksos were invaders. They came into Egypt and they took it over and they dominated it for a couple of centuries. The Egyptian pharaohs were killed and slaughtered. Their families were murdered. The, the women were put into slavery. And the women were actually buried along with the warriors who died. They buried the Egyptian female slaves next to them. They were brutal people. This is Egypt's punishment after the Exodus. This. So here is the arrival. Here is the prospering. Here is the slavery. Here is the Exodus. And off to the Promised Land and the conquest of Jericho. What you're saying is that what you're seeing is that the pattern of evidence was seeing that, that which the film is going to be you know, explaining and is that in this middle Bronze Age one time period, the 12th dynasty, is when we saw, you saw it, and others, that there was this influx coming in to the Brand new people brand coming new people into coming the Eastern Delta. And they were allowed to be there. What VTech they were, told me. Yeah, exactly. They were under the invite of the Pharaoh, yeah. just so, like in the Bible. So when I was talking with Manfred VTech, he said to me that these people were given an invitation to be here. They, the, in other words, it looked as if the, they were guests and allowed to settle in that land matching, once again, the story, the pattern of the story. And as you quote, Joseph then settled his father and brothers, giving them the land holdings in Egypt in the very best part of the country, which at this particular point in Genesis, it says the region of Ramesses. Other times it says Goshen. Just as Pharaoh had ordered, Pharaoh had given them permission to settle in the best part of Egypt, the, the richest and luscious part. And here it is. This is the land of Goshen photographed from the Austrian excavation dig house of Manfred Bita looking out on the fields where the Israelites lived. And, and that, that was then what, when I started to realize that we were looking for patterns of evidence. Let's start over and say, where does the pattern begin? And that began, uh, for me as a filmmaker, the approach yeah. to, to take. And I could see that that was the scientific approach. Mm -hmm. And so once we said, let's be free of the dating question, let's just look for the pattern. Because mm -hmm. of, of all the information that you know now about the questions about dating. Mm -hmm. So that, that gave us the freedom to look for the pattern. Sure. So let's actually follow this up now. Just so you know where Goshen is. It's right there. So it's in the eastern delta. It's the nearest part of the fertile uh, delta to Israel and Canaan, okay? It's on the border of Egypt, effectively, and any Asiatics or Semites coming into Egypt would have settled in the nearest part to their own homeland. That's the area they were given. So what, uh, what is this land of Goshen that later is called the land of Ramesses? Well, it's located in the eastern delta, as we've seen. It's in the gnome the Egyptians call Gesem, Okay, which is biblical Goshen. And it's by the, what we call the Pelusiac branch of the River Nile. That's the, the most furthest east branch of the River Nile. It's on the eastern side of the Pelusiac branch of the River Nile. At a place in this time now, in the Middle Bronze Age, which was known as Avaris. And it later became Pyramese. The, the city was renamed at the time of Ramesses II, Pyramese. And I suppose you want to ask that question now. Well... You know, how did that happen? How come the Bible refers to it as Ramses? Well, it, it's a little bit like the, the Dutch founding New York. Seems reasonable to you, that statement, doesn't it? Did they found New York? No. They founded New Amsterdam. But we're perfectly happy with the idea of them founding New York. Or the Roman Sixth Legion comes into England and builds a garrison in the city of York, which New York's named after. And you'll see that in your encyclopedias. But the Romans didn't find, uh, establish their garrison in, in York. They founded a, a garrison in Eboracum, which is what the Romans called it. It was only when the Vikings came along and renamed it Jorvik that we get the name York. But you'll read an encyclopedia that says the Sixth Legion founded a garrison at York. So the same thing going on here. And the, and the thing that we try to show uh, in the film is that underneath the city of Ramesses is this older city of ours. And so the challenge is, is that the name Ramesses actually is the name of a pharaoh, mm -hmm. it's the name of a time period, and it's mm -hmm. the name of a city, a city that was built at a particular time. The royal city of the king. He, he founded this city of Ramesses, which you're going to see now, on top of Avaris, the older city. So what the Bible is telling you isn't so much what they built as where they built. So the Israelites built a city at the place where 
the audience of the time reading the Bible would know to be Ramses because that did know Ramses. Ramses was very famous, the city. They wouldn't have known the ancient name for it, which was Avaris. So here, we're looking down on the very area we're talking about. And this thing here is a, what we call a tell, or a ruin mound. In fact, it occupied this entire area, but what happened was the farmers, the Fala'in in this area, had been plowing these fields and digging out the ancient site over the centuries, leaving only this last tiny bit of it left here. So this entire area was developed. And another city was found here underneath Cantia. So if I show you now the landscape as it was in ancient times, they used drill cores, about 850 drill cores, to establish that the river, Pelusiat River, the Nile flowed through here one time. And it divided into two. So the original name of the town, or the, the village here, was Rowati, which means the mouth of the two ways, where the river Nile split in two, went off to the Mediterranean. And it's on these turtlebacks here, these islands, that they established the first settlement. And in the inundation season, of course, all this area would be flooded, except for these sand islands that you see here. So they built the village on top of those. So we're in the eastern side, and I'll now show you the settlements. So Avaris, the ancient city, was built predominantly on this island and in this area down here. And later, Ramesses, the focus of Ramesses, the city of Ramesses, was here with a royal palace. However, the southern district of Ramesses was built on top of Avaris. So the whole thing was one massive city in the 19th dynasty. But the Israelite city is this one, the earlier one, the Middle Bronze Age one. And here it is. And this is the, one of the photographs of uh, the excavations a few years ago now, which have collapsed, as you see, and overgrown in this particular part on the main tell. Here's the village of Tel Adaba, which is the name that Tim mentioned uh, earlier. Tel Adaba means the mound of the hyena, and this is the village basically which sits on top of the ancient Israelite city. That's what it looked like when it was being excavated in the 1960s, this particular part here, and you can see them digging down and reve revealing all the important archaeology under this tell. And we managed to reconstruct the actual complex here and the buildings, etc., as we found them from archaeology, from the reports. What you have is the Egyptian enclave, with nicely plastered houses. You have the royal palace and the private temple of the king facing the Pelusiac branch of the Nile. And then behind it, this massive Semitic poor, poor area where the Samites lived in this area. They also lived across the river here, but we didn't reconstruct that. But this was the main area of the town. And it turned out to be one of the biggest cities in the ancient world. It was actually more than one mile by one mile square in terms of its size. Huge population. So, the Middle Bronze II sea city of Avaris, the Middle Bronze Age city, this is the only real candidate for the era and location of the Israelite sojourn as handed down in the biblical tradition. There is no other one. This is when we have the large population of Semites. These people, as you'll see in a little while, live there for a while, they expand, they become slaves, there's some terrible disaster hits the place. They all leave. Forty years later, Jericho's destroyed. If we look at the excavations, I'll now show you what the Israelites of that time looked like. Here they are. The Austrians are excavating. You'll notice that they're digging down less than a couple of feet before they reach the levels because the farmers have plowed the rest away above, leaving us just the foundations. Here's a typical pair of Israelite graves. Because there are no stones in this area, because it's the delta, they use mud bricks to build their graves, and they are pits in the ground lined with bricks with a vaulted ceiling. This has been dug away, but this would have been an arch ceiling running across the entire grave here. This one has been dug out, so this one is still to be excavated. This one is open, and I'm going to show you the interior of one of these graves now. You'll notice that the body is lying on its side. Now, Egyptians are not buried on their sides. They're buried on their backs, with their hands down like that. And if you're a pharaoh, like that. And if you're a queen, like that. Okay? But an ordinary person would be buried on his back, usually in a coffin. This guy is on his side, with his knees up, in what we call the semi-fetal position. This is very much a trait of Semitic peoples from Canaan. This is how they buried the dead. And then along with the dead... 
they have pottery which tells of the date, archaeological date of the burial. Now, some of the wealthier tombs had remarkable things in, like, for instance, this magnificent bronze, what we call duckbill axe head. So it's like a duckbill axe because it's like the beak of a duck. It's also called a fenestrated axe because it has these two holes here. But this is a very typical middle bronze 2A axe or weapon. And, of course, we have typical Canaanite pottery. This is a storage jar from the middle bronze 2A. So this is how we date when this burial took place or when these burials took place. Another thing we find a lot of is tiny little vessels called Tel al Yahudiya ware, about the size, that size, which is usually for ointments, perfumes, etc., for the ladies. It's typical only of this period. Now, if I show you a waterlogged grave here, this is one from a garden tomb that you're going to see in a little while. You see this object here? That is actually a duckbill axe which has not been cleaned up. And this thing, I'm just going to restore that for you. When the archaeologists removed that from the grave and cleaned it up, it turned out to be a magnificent bronze belt. Now, this is what a chieftain would wear. With his long gown on, he would have this magnificent bronze belt around here, and he'd be wearing his dagger, his really important dagger, to show his status, his wealth, <coughs> his power amongst the tribe. And these are the daggers that were found in these graves. Beautiful bronze ribbing, ivory handles, gold rivets to hold the framework together. This is high status material. This is not cheap rubbish. This is really top class Canaanite Semitic uh, weaponry. And let me just put a little quote in from the Bible. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their daggers are vicious weapons. So even in the Bible, we hear reference to these weapons, these daggers being worn by tribal chieftains, the sons of Jacob. And now, in some of these high-status burials of these chieftain figures, they, they were brought, the bodies were brought to the grave on a truck, a cart, dragged by two donkeys, and then a pit was dug in front of the graves, and the throats of the donkeys were slit, and they were buried in front of the grave. Now that is again typically from uh, Canaan, from uh, Israel, later Israel, we have this type of burial. But what's important is along with the two donkeys were two sheep placed in their sacrificial sheep. And the bone analysis by the experts on this has demonstrated that these sheep were from North Syria. They are actually the long-haired Syrian variety which is exactly where the patriarchs came from. And this is the first time we see them in Egypt. We don't have the sheep, this type of sheep in, in Egypt until this era. And we all know that the Israelites were shepherds. I think that that's one of the things that always continued to be supportive of the story. The pattern was matching once again, the pattern, the pattern, the pattern. And I think that it wasn't just, I, I was surprised by some of the other, you know, people who've looked in this, they haven't really thought much about the, the, the verses and looked at it and said, well, what are the clues you would look for? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, and, and once again, the pattern, when you start to add up all the pieces, the pattern really started to make sense to me. Because I didn't want to make a film that was uh, off track. I was trying to understand what, you know, something that was valid, that was legitimate. And we had uh, numerous other scholars that have looked at this and said, mm. yes, this matches the story yeah. and the time. But you asked Beta the question, what were these people like? And he told you they were shepherds. Yes. And yet he still didn't identify them as the Israelites. Right. He called the, uh, did he say proto-Israelites? Well, no, he always not use that word. Oh, no. no. He wouldn't use that word. So you, you, th they can't see the wood for the trees. It's essentially what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'll move on because we're getting yeah. a little bit okay. time compressed here. So let's move on to Joseph, shall we? This is the historical events behind the tradition of the sojourn. Well, just before the time when I placed Joseph's arrival, we start to see Semites coming into Egypt. This is from Beni Hassan, and they are wearing, yes, you've got it, multicolored coats. This is the only time in Egyptian history we have visual art of Semitic peoples entering Egypt wearing this type of colored coat. In the New Kingdom, when you have their, you know, the standard chronology, they wear white coats with trim 
on their sleeves and around their necks. They don't wear multicolored coats. And here is the leader of the, of the brigade coming in, the 37 uh, people, I would call them Midianites. His name is Abishah, and he's called a Hyksos, or a ruler of the foreign countries, and he's got a fabulous coat, much better than the rest of the men of the tribe. So status is all important here. You get the best coat if you're the leader. This is the time of two pharaohs, Sennacherib the third, and Amenemhat the third, who were co-regents. This is the father, this is the son. What's noticed about these two is how miserable they are. <laughs> these are the only two pharaohs in Egyptian history which look like this. Look at the way the mouth is turned down. Look at the furrows here. Look how the ears are turned, big ears, are turned around at right angles. Now, in visual art, an art historian will tell you that what this reflects is concern on the part of the pharaoh for his people. It's not smiley, smiley pharaohs here. This is pharaohs who are worried, who are concerned for Egypt, showing concern for it, and it's the only time we see this. And there's a reason for it. This is the Fayum Basin, which we'll come back to in a minute. Great Lake, Birkat Karun. But this is a quote from the Bible. Genesis 41, 17, 21. So Pharaoh told Joseph, In my dream there I was standing on the bank of the river Nile when seven fat cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile and began to feed amongst the rushes. And then seven more cows came up behind them, starved, very wretched and lean. I have never seen such poor cows in all Egypt. The lean and wretched cows devoured the seven fat cows, but when they had devoured them, it was impossible to tell, for they looked as wretched as ever. That's Pharaoh's dream. That's what Joseph was tasked to interpret. Now, what's important here, and what's not mentioned in the Bible, is that these cows came up out of the Nile. That's not explained in the Bible. But from this connection we've made now between the story of Joseph and Egyptian history and archaeology, we can explain the reason now for the cause of the famine. Now, you all know about Nile inundations. Every year in the late spring, the Nile floods its banks. Waters come down the River Nile from Ethiopia, uh, from the Blue Nile and the White Nile, and they flood the Egyptian plain up to the desert plateau. <clears throat> and this happens regularly every year. But the level that it comes to is very crucial to whether or not Egypt prospers or whether it starves. And what we have down in Upper Egypt, this is Nubia here, there's Abu Simbel, there's Aswan. We come right the way down here to the border of Egypt in this period before we get to the land of Kush, which is in Sudan. We have two forts either side of a gorge. <coughs> one is called Semna and the other one is called Kuma. Here's an aerial photograph of those two forts, there and there. And what happened was, in this particular period, in the reign of Amenemhat III, they started to record the heights of the Nile in the inundation, <coughs> year by year. First time it had happened, they hadn't done it before. And we believe what it was was an early warning system to tell people further north how high the flood was going to be. And if I show you a very complicated chart, I'll do it, explain it very quickly. This is the <coughs> low level of the river for most of the year. This is the standard flood level in modern times. That means the last 2,000 years here. But in this time, in the reign of Amenemhat, we see these records here, and they tell us that the flood jumped from 12 metres up to around 80 metres in year three of the king. And then suddenly, a few years later, it zooms up to 21 metres. So we have a massive increase in water coming into the Nile. It's, this is four times the typical average flood, four times the quantity. So there, this is your seven years of plenty, and that is your seven years of famine. Plenty because increased water here to this perfect level means more harvest because you can expose more areas to water inundation and the fertile silt. Here, destruction. Total destruction, villages wiped out, cattle uh, killed, drowned, sheep drowned. And the important thing is, if this land is flooded with four times the water, it takes four times as long for the water to dissipate out to the Mediterranean. 
so you can't plant your crops. Because when it comes to the end of the season, when you need to plant your seed in the ground, the ground is waterlogged. And if it happens year after year after year after year, you get a famine. That's why the cows came out of the river Nile in Pharaoh's dream. The Nile is the cause of both the plenty and the famine. This is the water conditions that they would have been confronted with at the time of planting. So in Genesis 45, 6, for this is the second year of the famine. There has been famine in the country and there are still five years to come without plowing or harvest. Now, if the, the famine had been caused by a drought, that would not stop plowing. The only thing that stops plowing is water. So what does Joseph do about it? Well, he's a genius, this man. This is the, the great Fayum Lake, and it, this is what it looks like today. It's called Birkat Karun. This is a huge lake. In the time of Joseph and Pharaoh Amenemhat, it was this size, absolutely enormous. Why did it grow so big? Well, because of this canal that was dug from the Nile to siphon off 50% of the flood water into this sump to take away the potential for disaster further north. So he devised this canal, or somebody devised this canal, to divert 50% of the water. King Amenemhat was so pleased with this operation, he actually built his pyramid right on this canal at Awara. He regarded this as the most important thing that had been achieved in his reign. And the name of the canal? Bar Yosef, the waterway of Joseph. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has given you knowledge of all this, there can be no one as intelligent and as wise as you. You shall be my chancellor, which is means vizier, and all my people shall respect your orders. Only the throne shall set me above you, the second most important person in the land. So what do you do with the second most important person in the land? Well, as he gets older, you pension him off with a beautiful house in the land of Goshen, and you can say, you can retire here with your children and your grandchildren and be blessed. You've done your duty for the kingdom, and now you can relax and take it easy. Now, unfortunately, we don't hear much about that in the Bible until Joseph's on his deathbed, where he gathers together the brethren, and he tells them, I'm not going to be here for much longer, and I know that one day you will leave Egypt, and you will go to the promised land. You make sure you take my body with you. You be sure, you promise me now, that you'll take my body with you. So, let's find Joseph in the land of Goshen. We start with Jacob, because in the famine, in the second year, Joseph arranges for Jacob and his family to come and settle in the land of Goshen. And in this field, Jacob built a house. This is the reconstruction from the movie of Jacob's house. It's what we call a middle style house, which is the earliest form of the so-called four-roomed house, or Israelite house. If I put a plan up, you can see that it's basically an open room or courtyard surrounded by other rooms here. These are possibly for animals to be kept in this area, but the main part of the house was this here, middle style house. It comes from North Syria, this design. It comes from the area where the patriarchs, origina patriarchs originated. This is the type of house you would expect a patriarch to build in Egypt. And of course, Jacob was a patriarch. And then, after a while, that house, according to the archaeology, was knocked down. The owner of the house had died, and it was decided to build a palace on top of it. And this is the floor of the palace that was excavated by the Austrians. What you see here is a mud brick floor which was painted white, and then you have the settings here for two stone bases for wooden columns to hold it up. It was basically a very, very nice audience chamber, and I'm going to show you the reconstruction from the movie again now of that Egyptian-style palace, but it wasn't built for an Egyptian. It was built for a Semite, possibly the vizier, the northern vizier. When we look at a plan, this part over here was added later. The original facade was here, along here, and this courtyard was added later, including these two suites here, and a new entrance here. But the original part of the house was this here. This is the, the shot you just saw of the four column bases and the mud brick floor. This was the audience chamber to receive visitors. This was his wash, personal washroom, 
and this is probably his robing room here, and this, believe it or not, was his bedroom. And this is a mud brick platform, which is the biggest bed ever found in the ancient world. You would expect that for Joseph, wouldn't you? The guy who interpreted dreams to have the best bed in the world. <laughs> now, what struck me immediately about this, and by the way, these two suites are identical. How many sons did Joseph have? So when they were growing up and were getting their first wife, he built two apartments for them, exactly the same. No arguing. You can't have a bigger one than him. You must both have the same size apartment. And significantly, the original facade of Joseph's palace had, you guessed it, 12 columns, representing the 12 brothers, 12 tribes. In the back garden, and this is now the palace over here, this is the model that the Austrian excavators built for the palace. You'll see a series of tombs, and I suppose you're already ahead of me. There are 12 of them. 12 main tombs, subsidiary ones, possibly for wives here, but 12 main ones. Each one had a tree planted in front of it. But you'll notice number 12 is rather different to the rest. Number 12 is a pyramid tomb. Here you see that pyramid tomb at the back of the garden, dated at the same time as the palace here. The ones that you see along the line here, and these ones are slightly earlier. By the way, those daggers that I showed you earlier on came from these tombs. Now that pyramid tomb is what we're going to concentrate on now. This is the photograph before they started to ex excavate down into the tomb. What you see here is a platform made of mud brick and then on the front, a base for a chapel. So you have a pyramid with a chapel in front of it. As I say, they haven't started excavating, and now the plan of it looks like this. Here's your platform base for the pyramid. Here's your chapel. And underground, underneath the pyramid, we have a mud brick vault where the burial took place. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Here they are digging down into the burial chamber. And this is all they found inside a few broken bits of limestone, and that strange thing. I'll show you the excavation of the actual tomb itself. Here we see this man in the blue galabere standing in the corner of the tomb. That's the chapel over there. There's the fragments of limestone and this large group of heavier limestone here. That is what we're going to concentrate on in a minute. And looking in the other direction, here is that object again, looking from the chapel towards the burial chamber, and in the burial chamber, all you've got is this piece of limestone and two more pieces of limestone from the same object. Completely empty. No bones, no mummy beads, no coffin wood, no pottery. Absolutely empty. So the archaeologist said, oh, I know why that is. Because there's a tunnel that's been dug in from the chapel into the burial chamber, and everything has been cleaned out. But then I asked BTAC, what grave robber would take the bones? What's the value of the bones to a grave robber? It doesn't work. This is not robbery. This is removal, pious removal of the body. So now we're cr the crunch time is what is this? Well, it stood in the chapel in front of the tomb. And when they assembled the bits, it was quite clear that it was part of a human statue the top half. But you'll notice that the whole of the face has been smashed off. This is reconstruction here. The eyes have been gouged out with an ax. Look at this massive hit on the top of the head there. But we also have a throw stick on the shoulder. Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. If we look at the hair, <coughs> beautifully coiffured, beautifully combed, and the original paint still survives on this statue, red hair flame red hair. And on the forehead, although you can't see it too well, this is yellow paint. So yellow skin, red hair, beautifully coiffured and combed in what we call the mushrooms hairstyle. And on his shoulder, a throw stick. Now, a throw stick is a symbol of an Asiatic or Semite. So this high official with this statue is an official of state, but he's a foreigner. He's not an Egyptian. 
<coughs> on the back shoulder, I began to see, can you see, fragments of paint in stripes. See that one? Can you see them coming in this direction here or on the shoulders, the collar, and then they go down vertically? If I highlight that for you, just a little bit, just help you to understand it. It's a multicolor coat. So this statue, which is twice life size, seated statue, of a high official of state with yellow skin, red hair, wearing a multicolor coat in a tomb, a pyramid tomb. Now, a pyramid tomb is normally not given to a high official. In this period, only kings had pyramids. Only kings had colossal statues. No individual other than a king would have that. This guy has been honored to the highest level that a king could grant. Art historians have looked at this statue and said that it was carved and made in the royal workshops next to the pyramid of Amenemhat III. Okay, so the king ordered this statue for this individual. So let's restore his face. Red hair, yellow skin, collar, multicolored coat. And this is the reconstruction from the movie of the chapel with the statue. And if only we had the other part of this, we'd be able to read the name of the individual. And this is his name in hieroglyphs. And that's the name of Joseph in his Egyptian name. So, David, what was Joseph's Egyptian name? Okay, I think we've got time to do that if we go very quickly. Um, Pharaoh gave Joseph an Egyptian name. His name, Yosef, was his original name. And then Pharaoh said, <coughs> I'm going to give you a new name. Now, in, in tradition, in uh, Semites living in Egypt were given a name, and they were called ex-Semitic name, he who is called, and then the Egyptian name. So you always get this he who is called phrase. Okay? So the Egyptian name in the Bible is Zaphanat Pa'anea. Okay? Now, Zaphanat Pa'anea has got metathesis. It should be a Zatanath. Okay? So the T and the F have rotated. It's like, uh, for instance, you'll get a Caribbean gentleman might say, ask me something, instead of ask me something. Okay, you get the inversion of the, of the of consonants. And the same thing has happened here. It's really Zatanath, not Zafanat. Okay? So that in Egyptian is he who is called. So the next name, Pa'anea, is the real name given to him by the king. And Pa'anea, Anea, is the vocalization, the true vocalization of the word Ankh in Egyptian, which means life the sign of life, or the loop. So his name is the one who lives. So Joseph, he who is called the one who lives. Why did Pharaoh give him that name? Because Jacob came to the Egypt and found the son he believed to be dead was still alive. So we'll have to move on because I'm being a bit slow. Very quickly, I want to tell you about the alphabet. This Joseph character was a genius, an absolute genius. He was in charge of pretty much everything in the land. One of the things he was due to organize was the mining of turquoise in Sinai. And this genius man who was trained to read the hieroglyphs, write the hieroglyphs, but also being a Semite, came up with something quite extraordinary at a place called Sarabit el Kadim, which is the main turquoise mine in Sinai which is up the top of this mountain. I'll do this very quickly. You climb up to the heights in the middle of Sinai, and you arrive at a temple here, right on the top of the mountain. This is the temple of Hathor, who is the lady of turquoise, the, the goddess of the turquoise mines. These stela are all dedicated to her, and they have Semitic names on them of the workforce that was sent here to, to mine the turquoise. Here is Hathor, the goddess with the strange wig and the eyes, and she's called uh, Hathor. And here we have Meket uh, Mofkat, which is the, the, the Lady of Turquoise, which is her title. Here is one of the mines where they excavated the turquoise, and what Petrie found, Flinders Petrie found in here, was quite remarkable. He found a script carved on the mine face, and it's clearly hieroglyphics, but nobody could read it. It didn't read Egyptian. So Petrie was scratching his head and couldn't work it out. And then Sir Alan Gardner came along and worked out what was going on here. And he realized that it was actually Hebrew.
but written in hieroglyphs. And it's called Proto-Sinaitic. So here is your Hebrew alphabet with the earliest form of writing. So what happens, for instance, I'll give you an example here. Um, the water sign in Egyptian hieroglyphs is the word for nu, water. But in Hebrew, it's mayim. So that becomes the letter M. The house, bait, Egyptian pear. Okay, so brilliantly, he takes Egyptian hieroglyphic signs, he actually gives the Hebrew name to them, and the first letter of the Hebrew name becomes the letter of the alphabet. And it can go all the way through the alphabet, right the way down to Tav, which of course is the cross. And this one over here, Aleph, which is the ox. Let me give you an inscription from there, which you can read just about, if I highlight it. This says, Mem Aleph Ayin Mem. It's a very crude form of the word, Mayim, and that is a leather water bag. Water. Let's look at uh, the, the letter Aleph, just to show you how that evolves into the modern alphabet. Here is our modern letter A. You can do this with all the letters of our alphabet. This is it in Phoenician, rotated 90 degrees with the, the cross member breaking through the diagonals. And this is it in Proto-Sinaitic from this particular cave. And if I now put the details in, it's an ox, Aleph. So we get our modern alphabet through Proto-Sinaitic, through proto canaanite Hebrew, through Phoenician, through Greek to our modern alphabet. That's all down to Joseph. Joseph gave us our alphabet. And the reason why you believe it's Joseph, why, why do you think that that's the case? It, it requires it to be a Semite with a superb education who was an administrator who could write in hieroglyphs but wanted to develop a script for writing Hebrew. Now, I would have originally thought of Moses, but we now find that these inscriptions are dated to the late 12th dynasty, which is before Moses. So it has to be somebody else. And the only thing person I can think of who capable of doing that was the man who was the most important official in the land of the pharaohs, the vizier, capable of doing all this, who was a Semite, who lived in that palace in, in, the, in the Eastern Delta. It's logical to assume that it must be Joseph who did this. Hmm. So I'll get on to Moses very quickly. Who was the pharaoh who raised Moses in the palace? So here's the text, famous one from Exodus 1. Then there came to power in Egypt a new king who did not know Joseph. Joseph had died. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites are now more numerous and stronger than we are because they've prospered. We must take action to stop them from multiplying. Or if war should break out, they might join forces with our enemies. They might take up arms against us and then escape from the country. Accordingly, they put taskmasters over the Israelites to wear them down by forced labor. This is the introduction to Moses and his birth. They prospered, they've got numerous, they've become powerful, and we've seen that because in the 13th dynasty, most of the officials were Semitic. They weren't Egyptians. In fact, even the, some of the pharaohs were Semitic at that time. One of the most telling and saddest things about the archaeological excavations at Tel Adaba Avaris is they found hundreds of tiny graves. These are mud bricks here, so that's a little baby, all over the site. Now, in most ancient sites, infant burials, burials represent around 25% of the cemetery population. In other words, one quarter of most graves you find in the ancient world belong to infants one year old or less. In this site, at Avaris, infant burials represent 50% of the total cemetery population. There is a massive doubling of the number of infant burials. And then, with the remaining adult population that are left over, of the remaining adult burials, there are three females to every two males. That tells me that these infants are mostly male, because there's a skew in the population. These slaves go from being 50-50 male, male and female to a strong bias towards female in adulthood. And we know what that story is. Now, there is a, a, a writer, a Jewish 
historian called Artapanus of probably Iranian extraction, we believe he might have been from Persia. And he actually wrote a history of the Jews for the Greek pharaohs, the Ptolemies. And his history was um, placed in the Alexandrian Library. Then, of course, later on the Christians came along and burnt it to the ground, and we lost his original manuscript. We've never been able to recover that. However, other people, other scholars, quoted from him excerpts, extracts from his history of the Jews. And he tells us the pharaoh who raised Moses in the palace. Even though the Bible just says pharaoh, he names him. Now, remember, he's writing in Greek for his Greek masters, the Greek pharaohs, the Ptolemies. This is what he calls the pharaoh who raised Moses. Genofres. Gen, three elements. Genofres. We can translate that back into Egyptian as Kha Nefere. Or Kha Nofre. That is the name of just two kings of ancient Egypt. One in the old kingdom, which doesn't count, and this guy. Kha Nefere Sobekot at the fourth is one of the only two kings in the entire history of Egypt with this prenomen. In other words, the coronation name. So this is the name Artapanus gives to the pharaoh, and we can identify him with this king called Sobekot at the fourth. Here he is. He's the most powerful pharaoh of the dynasty, the 13th dynasty. Here are statues of him from Karnak. He is the 29th ruler of the 13th dynasty. And I'm very quickly going to show you his position. But he probably had a summer palace like this one at Avaris, where he would have met, uh, or Moses would have been raised, and then perhaps in the confrontations of the Exodus, this had been the place where those confrontations would have taken place. If you look at uh, the site again from a different angle, you can imagine here's Pharaoh's palace and the temple. You can imagine the princess bathing in the water here or coming out to bathe in the water here. And down here, the baby Moses being placed in his basket and then the water taking him towards the palace where he would have been found by Pharaoh's daughter. When you get the archaeological evidence, you can start to see the story evolving and working. So Moses was then raised in the palace of Canofres, Canofere. He would be an educated man, learning hieroglyphs, etc. Here we see the, a fragment of the royal canon of Turin, which is a pyramid, uh, king's list of the pharaohs. And here we get this last sub-dynasty that enslaved the uh, Israelites. So we got up the third. We have a Brooklyn papyrus with slave lists of, with Semitic names in there. And then we have Neferhotep, a very powerful king, and Sobekhotep the fourth, who was the one who was the father, the stepfather rather, of Moses. When he died, there's the start of the 13th dynasty. When he died at the bottom of the papyrus, the 29th king, we come to the next column over here. We need to be looking for the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So if I go 45 years down, it's approximately 45 because we don't have the exact dates. We come to this little fragment of the papyrus here and the name Dudimos. Remember that name because he's the pharaoh of the Exodus, not Ramesses II, this nobody, this guy who nobody's ever heard of. He's virtually the last king of the 13th dynasty and it's his time when this happens according to Manetho. Have you heard of Manetho? He's the Egyptian priest who wrote a history of the Egyptians who mentions, quoted in Josephus, who mentions this. And this is quite striking. In the time of a king called Tutimaeus, remember he's writing in Greek again for the Ptolemies, Tutimaeus is Dudimos. In his reign, for what cause I know not, a blast of God smote us. And God here is in the singular. You would expect an Egyptian to be writing, and the gods smote us. But he doesn't. He refers to one God smiting the Egyptians. And he continues, and Kai in Greek, which means what follows on from God smiting. Unexpectedly, from the regions of the east across the Sinai, invaders of obscure race marched in confidence of victory against our land. By main force, they easily seized it without striking a blow. And having overpowered the rulers of the land, they then burned our cities ruthlessly, raised to the ground the temples of the gods, and treated all the natives with cruel hostility, massacring some, and leading into slavery the wives and children of others. That is the punishment of Egypt. That is post-Exodus, the invasion of the Hyksos, coming into Egypt, being able to take over the land without striking a blow. There is no army to defend Egypt. Why? It's at the bottom of the sea. 
Otherwise, Egypt would have been defended by the army. And at this very moment, at the city of Avaris, Tel Adaba, in Stratum G1, the Austrians came across scores of pits in the ground, shallow pits, with bodies thrown in on top of each other. Look how this guy's leg lies across this guy's chest. This one is flat on his back. That one's on his stomach. Here's another example. This guy's just literally been tossed into the grave and his arm's fallen forward. Betak, the excavator, says what happened in Egypt at this moment was a terrible plague struck the place. And the people died. And they had to bury them in emergency burials for fear of contamination of the survivors. And right afterwards, the entire Asiatic quarter of the city vanished. They simply closed their doors and they left. And for a period we're not too sure how long, maybe five years, six years, the place was left to the drifting sand. And then in came the Hyksos and occupied the site and completely bulldozed it flat and built a mortuary cult on top of this site where they buried the Hyksos uh, kings. At the end of Stratum G, marking the end of the 13th dynasty, the main Tel area was abruptly abandoned and the Semitic population vanished. So here we are, this is the location now we're dealing with. We're not saying Ramesses in the 19th dynasty was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. We're saying it happened down there under Dudimos at the close of the 13th dynasty. And this, 40 years later, approximately 40 years later, is when we should be looking for a Jericho that was destroyed. And then we have the Egyptian collapse with the Hyksos dominating the country for two centuries before the recovery in the 18th dynasty. So, we're not going to deal with where they went, because that's for the next film. So I'm going to very quickly jump forward to the conquest. And I should be able to wrap this up within the time we've got left. So remember our chart? We have the Iron Age town built by Hiel on the body of his two sons in the time of Ahab, circa 18, 800 BC. Then we have, going backwards, the 600-year gap at Jericho. Then we have the destruction of the Middle Bronze city, destroyed by Joshua. And Dave, what you're saying is that this Dudamos and the end of his kingdom and the, the dark or the, the second intermediate period yeah. is right there. That, uh, is right at that spot. The second dark age hits in right at that spot. Okay. And it's caused by the Israelites and God, destroying the Egyptians. The walls collapse at Jericho. There's heavy burning of the site, and the site is abandoned, as I say, for 600 years, just as in the biblical story. Joshua 6, 20 and 26. When the people heard the sound of the trumpet, they raised a mighty war cry, and the wall of Jericho collapsed then and there. At once the people stormed the city, each man going straight forward, and they captured the city. And at that time, Joshua made them take his oath before Yahweh, Accursed before Yahweh be the man who rises up and builds this city. On his firstborn will he lay his foundations. On his youngest son he will set up its gates. Exactly as happens with Hiel in the Iron Age 1b, the new city is built and he sacrifices his two children as foundation deposits for the building of the new city. In the time of Ahab and Omri. So if you look at Jericho, this is looking down on Jericho. Excavated in the 1950s by Kathleen Kenyon. I'm going to take you to this trench that she dug. She dug several trenches, but this is one that I studied myself. Here is the trench during the excavations. You see she dug right down into the tell. Here's me examining the stratigraphy, because when you cut down into a trench, you can see the different layers, one on top of the other. And what I'm going to show you now is the structure of the defensive system, which is a foundation of... Uh, which of the wall that's on the top of the tell here, a sloping rampart made of plaster, a glassy we call it, at the bottom a revetment wall made of stone. And so it's virtually impossible to attack this, this monstrous structure, these high walls that you see at Jericho in the Middle Bronze Age. Let me put together on top of that the existing structure which has now disappeared. So you have the revetment wall made of stone at the bottom, you have the plaster slope, glassy here, and you have the city wall at the top. And when Kathleen Kenyon excavated this, she found the wall had collapsed 
and had rolled down and was ended up at the bottom. The mud bricks from the top wall ended up at the bottom. The walls came a tumbling down. And then they set the thing alight and burnt the whole city to the ground. So again, this is the wonderful reconstruction from the movie. When the archaeologists were excavating the houses, they found large storage jars full of grain. This grain was heavily charred from burning. But what this tells us is when the attack took place, when the destruction took place, it took place shortly after Passover, because that's when the harvest is brought in from the Jordan Valley. And we know it wasn't a long siege because the jars are still full. It must have been a very short siege of the city. What does the Bible tell us? Seven days. If we move on to Hatzor, very important site, the greatest or foremost of the kingdoms, according to the Bible. It was the, the royal citadel of a king called Jabin, who was the top knob of the area. Joshua 11, 10, 11. Joshua then turned back and captured Hatzor, putting its king called Jabin to the sword. Hatzor in olden days was the foremost of those kingdoms. In compliance with the curse of destruction, they put every living creature to the sword. Not a living soul was left and Hatzor was burnt to the ground. It suffered the same fate as Jericho. There were two or three major cities that suffered the same fate. What's key for me is the name of the king that Joshua personally thrust his sword into. When they were excavating it, and they're still excavating, this is the late Bronze Age palace up here, but if you go deep, deep down below that, they exposed the corner of the middle Bronze Age palace. This is the time when Jericho was destroyed. This is the time when Hatzor was destroyed. And in that area there, this is the corner of the building, they turned up a fragment of a tablet. In cuneiform, Akkadian, because this was the lingua franca of the region. This is how diplomats wrote to each other at this time. And this is actually a letter addressed to a king of Hatzor. And you want to know what his name is? He's called in Canaanite Akkadian, Yabni. And Yabni is biblical Jabin. So, the king who lived in this palace at the Middle Bronze Age that was burnt to the ground and destroyed has the same name as the king that Joshua slaughtered and burnt the city to the ground. How specific do you want me to get? <laughs> I'm going to finish now with a very, very important site, Shechem. Here is the great Migdol fortress of Shechem with the great Cyclopean wall sweeping around. The temple of Baal Berith, Lord of the Covenant, the foundations are here, facing east. And in front of it, in the courtyard, this has been excavated away, it was originally all at this level. Standing in front of the temple is this big white stone. If we look at it from another angle, as I say, this has been excavated, so this is actually modern support here. It was originally all at this level. There is the temple of Baal Berith the great Migdol temple, there is the standing stone. If I reconstruct it using the reconstruction from the movie, you get a better impression. David, what is this near? What two mountains is this near? Oh, they are called Gerizim and Nebal. Is that right? <coughs> Ebal. Ebal. That being Gerizim on that side. So we have the oak tree. We have the, the tower temple, the Migdol temple of Baal. Baal, sorry, Baal Barith, the Lord of the Covenant. We mustn't say Baal because it doesn't mean Baal, the evil Baal. This is the Lord, word for Lord in this particular case. The covenant of Abraham we're talking about here. And the standing stone. Who set the standing stone up? Joshua. So there is Joshua's standing stone in front of the temple. Still there to this day in the reconstruction I'll show you later. Sometime later, uh, about 100 years later or so, there was a king of Shechem called Abimelech, and he was a pretty bad character. And he decided to attack the city and kill everybody in the city. And this is a reconstruction of the fire of destruction which burnt this temple to the ground. And this is the text from that, Judges 9, 45, 49. All that day Abimelech attacked the town. He stormed it and slaughtered the people inside, raised the town and sowed it with salt. On hearing this, all the leading men inside Migdol Shechem took refuge in the crypt of the temple of Baal Berith. 
Abimelech's men piled branches over the crypt and set it on fire over those who were inside, so that all the people in Migdol Shechem died, about a thousand men and women. And what does archaeology show us? That this temple was destroyed by fire about a hundred years later, exactly matching the story in the Bible, the book of Judges. So, this monolith here is one of the most important artifacts from the Bible. Joshua 24, 25, 28. That day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. He laid down a statue and ordinance for them to, at Shechem. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of Yahweh. He then took a large stone and set it up there under the oak tree in Yahweh's sanctuary. Joshua then dismissed the people, everyone to his own heritage. This was the renewal of the covenant, and that is the covenant stone of Joshua. If you go to Nablus today, ancient Shechem, you see that standing there, stone daubed in intifada graffiti by the youths, and then painted over in yellow paint to cover what they've written on it. Standing there forlorn, not recognized by anybody. The Israelis don't recognize it. The archaeologists don't recognize it for what it is. It's so obvious what it is, but of course, it's 300 years too early to be Joshua standing stone. So it can't be. Neither can that be the temple which Abimelech destroyed and burnt to the ground. So, let's look at our wall of time one more time. Now, when we didn't have any matches over here in the 19th dynasty or the 18th dynasty, suddenly we have a perfect match between the arrival of Joseph and Jacob in the Middle Kingdom towards the end of the 12th dynasty. The growth and multiplication of the city of Avaris so becomes one of the biggest cities in the ancient world, teeming with Semitic peoples. Suddenly, a slavery comes along. A change of dynasty happens where you get this sub-dynasty of major strong pharaohs who are native Egyptians who decide to enslave the population. We see it in the bones of the burials. We see it in the children, the infants that are buried, the massive increase in the burial of infants. And then we see the death pits at Avaris. And suddenly the whole population of Semites leaves the city and disappears. And then immediately following that, the Hyksos arrive, invade Egypt, and literally take over the place for two centuries, brutalizing the Egyptians. And finally, 40 years afterwards, in the Middle Bronze Age here in Canaan, we have a destruction of Jericho, where the walls fell down, where the city was burnt to the ground, and was abandoned for 600 years, where Jabin was killed at Hatzor, where the site of Shiloh was founded for the Ark for the very first time, and where at Shechem we find the covenant stone of Joshua erected by the leader of the Israelite tribes. I don't know how I can make it more factual than that. I don't see how anybody could ignore that evidence. I really don't. But that's what we have, and that's the fight we've got to fight, because the evidence is there. It's now a case of persuading everybody to look seriously at this model, because it gives us the answers we've been looking for. Thank you.